Richard. Um, some places in Judges where it says they did it again, right? That starts right away in Judges 3, verse 7. <clears throat> and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, forgetting the Baal, forgetting Yahweh their God and serving the Baals, right? Verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil. What's the construction there? Can you can you read the words? Do you see what the words are? Yes. Yeah. There's two verbs there. It's a verbal construct. No, you've missed the verb. You've missed the verb. You see the verb for C? I'm reading uh, Dr. Bowling's translation in the uh, Anchor Bible. Verse 12. The verb to do. That's the verb in front of it. Before mm -hmm. Well, the. Okay, And again, is the. Yes, it's a verb. It's the verb of that. Yes. When the Israelites continue doing what was evil. Well, that's the same verb that Joseph used to add, right? <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a good man. Yes, that's the verb to add as you continue. So, my, this is an answer to your question of two weeks ago, where you said, it wasn't this verse, but it was one just like it, where they translated it, they did it again. And the question was, doesn't again imply that they stopped doing it and started again? The verbal construct is that they continue to do... They added on to it, yes. So, what I'm telling you is that when it says they did it again, that that really is an unfortunate translation that applies the wrong thing. Why would such a translation exist in our Bible? Why would it be there? The translators would have preconceptions? Great and learned men, committees of this? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the preconception was that there was a repentance in there somewhere. It, it isn't there. Yeah. When the Israelites continued doing what was evil in Yahweh's sight, Yahweh strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they were doing what was evil in Yahweh's sight. He enlisted his allies, the Ammonites and the Malachites, and they went out and defeated Israel and gained control of and so forth. Okay, now, we're looking at, at that hero of faith, Gideon, are we not? Okay. Now, we were at an interesting point here, a point where, uh, <laughs> where we were, uh, Gideon had done something and now he had to, to deal with it. The spirit of, of uh, God in chapter 30, uh, chapter 6 verse 34 clothed Gideon he sounded the trumpet and the Abizarites were called out after him envoys he dispatched throughout Manasseh 
and they too were called out after him. On voice he also sent to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. Now, what happened next? That's the question. What happened next? Verse 7. Chapter 7, verse 7. Cherubiel, really Gideon, and we're going to talk about the names momentarily, and all the people who were with him busied themselves and pitched camp by Herod's spring. Not Herod, Herod with an A. Herod somebody many, many centuries later. By Herod's spring. The camp of Midian was in the valley north of Teacher's Hill. Yahweh said to Gideon, the people that are with you are too many for me to surrender Midian to their power. Else Israel might vaunt itself against me, saying, My own hand has rescued me. So announce at once within the people's hearing, Whoever is downright afraid, let him turn back. Let him decamp from Mount Fearful, not Mount Gilboa. Twenty-two units went home and ten units were left military units right not what what not thousands yes. <laughs> I guess we better go back and reiterate what we said about in, in uh, the census in numbers so that this makes sense to those who weren't here there's a census that begins and ends the book of Numbers. And by the time you finish reading the census, Israel had 600,000 or more men of war. And if Israel had 600,000 men of war between ages 20 and 50, then how many folk were there who came out of Egypt? What did we say about this before? Yeah, so we've got a couple million people. And what's the problem with that? <laughs> yeah, it's larger than the, that's larger than the population of Israel today. Greater is it? No. Inspiration by Alvin Thompson. I went to school with him at Paul Wallace and also at the community academy. I hear now that he's going to be at camp meeting this year, but he has a chapter on uh, Gene oh, numbers and genealogy and stuff. And apparently there's another place we're talking about there were 22,273 firstborn, which he represents that as the number of families, and uh, that meant there's an average of 80 people per family. 80, 80 children. 80 per ch Hope they had a good daycare system. <laughs> <laughs> 80 children. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's something wrong with the numbers and we know what it is fortunately let's uh, let's read uh, the census uh, numbers 1 verse 20 the people of Reuben Israel's firstborn their generations by their families by their father's houses according to the number of names head by head every male from 20 years old and upward all who were numbered, able to go forth for more. The number of the tribe of Reuben was 46,500. Uh, what's the problem there? The problem is that the word Ella or Ella depends on what what vowels we put into the consonant, right? We did this with the word apple, or a peel, P and L. Remember that? I was explaining the problem of Hebrew and putting, uh, trying to decide what word P and L would be in English. You just have a P and an L. Let me hand that camera over to this board, and let's play this game again. It'll be easier the second time around. The original Hebrew text had only consonants in it. And uh, 
many, many centuries later. In fact, after the time of Christ, in fact, 500 years after the time of Christ, folks from the 5th to the 9th century AD, folks were trying to decide what vowels shall we put and where around these consonants. Now, if we had these consonants, just leave it there. If we had these consonants in English and we just tried to decide what word that is, we'd probably go by the context, wouldn't we? But then the context is all consonants too. <laughs> And if you tried to read a uh, page of English with no vowels in it, you might find that it was a thrilling experience. Okay. Now, let us decide what word this might be without a context. What are some options as to what this word might be? Yeah. 
Okay. Which means what? Well, the problem is Ella means thousand, but Alu means chief, and Alu means family or unit. So our problem is with Ella, Alu, Ella, and so forth. These words all are from the same root and, and derived from each other. After the time of the monarchy, and in the late Old Testament history, Elif meant thousand, because it was a military unit of a thousand men in it. Okay. So that certainly in the time of Josiah, folks reading this would have said, this word is what? A thousand. Okay, come back over here. So that the folks in Josiah's day would have said, well, how many Israelites came, came out of Egypt? How many would they say? 600,000 men, a couple million people. What would have led people in Josiah's day to believe that Israel was such a huge number? Yes, because they, they were a couple million people. And they essentially saw a unity that uh, the folks who were there now, what? One for one were what? the folks who walk, walked out of Egypt. How they imagined this was accomplished would be what? It was just a giant what? Miracle offense. <laughs> okay. Now, since Aluf means chieftain, and Aluf means clan or family, and came to be the military unit supplied by family and clan. Remember that in the period of the judges, it wasn't a standing army, it was what? What good English word do we have for what this thing was that they called it? A militia. What's a militia? It's the home folk acting like military folk, right? It, it's how many people can the Smith send to help Gideon? Well, the Smith clan has 12 men between ages 20 and 50. So what will we say? Among the clans of Manasseh, there's the Smith. <laughs> and they have, they are one alu. Now, how many folks would that have been read later? These, a thousand. <laughs> <You've been family. laughs> so, what we have in numbers is a record of how many families there were. Well, how silly. They counted Israel by what? They numbered them by what? By families. We wouldn't do that. What would we count? We'd count individuals, of course. Why? Because we're Westerners, because we're Americans. And where does, where does the uh, emphasis fall? On the individual. Nobody would be nutty enough to go to war by himself in the ancient world. How do you go to war? By clan, by family, by tribe. Yeah, not by individual. So what we have probably is, let's try Manasseh. Where's Manasseh here? Because Manasseh is the tribe we're interested in right now because we're with Gideon, and he's a Manassite. Now Manasseh says, is in verse 34, and how many did they have? They had 32 uh, families that proper, properly represented how many men? Well, it gives it here. 200. Yeah. Let's try it again on a different clan to see if we've caught it. Uh, let's try Gad, verse 24. Well, isn't that 200 just part of the 32,200 number? It is not. Verse 25. What do you have? Tell me about Gad. Mm -hmm. 
the 45 families supplied 650 men. Yes. So that our 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 clan, our family unit, our subclan unit, ceased to be between 10 and 15 men. Now let's go back to Manasseh here again because we're interested in Manasseh at the time of the Exodus. Manasseh had 32 families that supplied 200 men. Okay. All right. So let's go over here now then to... Manasseh wasn't a very big tribe then. Let's go over here now then to... Ah. Modern liberal scholarship says no. These two censuses... Hard to say sensi. These two censuses in Numbers 1 and 26 represent the census that David took when he was numbering Israel. That's because you... Why would liberal scholarship say that? I reject that as an alternative. It's the common one. I reject it. Why? Because remember that liberal scholarship does not believe that there was an exodus of 12 tribes all at once. Right? It's been around and around it. It's because of the low date of the exodus there was this gradual infiltration of clans. Right? Asher was up there forever and then some others escaped and this one escaped and that one escaped and then there was an uprising of the general Hebrews who were the dispossessed population of Palestine. See, that's partly right. I think that's partly right. But by doing that, saying that the story as it's outlined in Numbers never happened, the story of the Exodus as we have it never happened, and I'm saying, no, that's not true. Why don't they want the story of the Exodus as we see it happening? There's a presupposition behind there. And that is what? That this all happened by natural cause. There was no God, no personal God, and no supernatural events, right? Your, your presupposition, have I said this before? Your presupposition determines your conclusion. Yeah. Now, because I'm saying that there was an all-Israel exodus with, with the 12 tribe system, and that David revived that 12 tribe system, that he tried to recreate it in his day to unify the two parts of his people that were at war, because he had these two leagues and they were at war, and he had to unify them, so he tried to recreate this system. He didn't make it out of whole cloth. He was appealing to the ancient tradition of the 12 tribes from Jacob who came out in the Exodus. Okay? Now, how? what do we have here in the Gideon story? Well, first of all, you who weren't here before, what does that mean about Israel? It means that the Israel that left Egypt was just a few thousand folk. Which is why, when they got to the end of the valley and they saw an Egyptian fort there, you know, that was had a it was forty feet long, the, the fort. <laughs> they said, oh, "We can't get by." <laughs> right? If there was an Egyptian fort there, manned by a couple hundred Egyptian soldiers, and there were two million people, what would they have said? <laughs> Gangway coming through, good luck. <laughs> yes. 600,000 fighting men, yeah. Well, they could have just stayed and ruled Egypt. Right? Uh, since the Egypt of the Nile Valley never, uh, never seems to have gotten bigger than a million people, they just could have moved in and enslaved the Pharaoh and said, here we are. Uh, yeah, we, there's no doubt that the, word, that the word thousand grew up from clan, gradually from the old word for family, family militia unit, then much later took on the meaning used in David's army and thereafter in the time of the monarchy to mean a military unit of a thousand people. Gradually the word took on the meaning one thousand, and then when they read the text, the continental text, they saw a word that meant a thousand. We know how it happened, um, and it makes perfect sense, and in fact the numbers as we have them make good sense. Okay? Anybody want to ask a question about that? That may bend your preconception of Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, but... Uh, we have to tell you that before we tell you what we're going to say about Gideon. <laughs> All right, anybody have any questions at this point? Now, the whole 
clan of Manasseh in the Exodus had 200 fighting men. Okay. There's a famous uh, King Misha of Moab in the 9th century is mentioned in the book of uh, Kings and we're going to come to him in due time. And he left us not one but two victory stelae in which he describes his casting off the yoke of Israel and becoming an independent state again. And uh, he boasts of his exploits, Roy, and he tells us that when he met Israel and fought to the death and conquered, that he had an army of 200 pit troops to mass against Israel. Okay? And he was impressed with that. What does that tell you? What does it tell you about the size of armies? It's a pretty small one. When, when our big turning point under Hezekiah came, the Assyrians, at their height, under this great uh, invasion in 701 under Sennacherib, devastated all of Judah. The 46 fortified cities of Judah were, were razed to the ground and the population massacred. And so only Hezekiah was left shut up in Jerusalem. How many men did this enormous empire that covered the whole civilized world mass around Jerusalem for its destruction? One of the most enormous armies of ancient history. And it's given a number. And it was Siegfried Horn who pointed out what the number is correctly. The number is 185,000, right? That's pretty... Yeah. Well, as a Hebrew text reads, if you want to read it, 185,000. And uh, Horn pointed out that the usual sequence of numbers in the ancient world means that this number is to be read how? 5,180 men. It's a huge army. Um, like the sand of the sea, right? Uh, of course, if you were inside Jerusalem and you saw 5,180 men outside, you'd be pretty despondent, wouldn't you? Why? What's about to happen? They're about to get killed. Yeah. Okay, so now, if you look at an army like that and say this army of 5,180 men was one of the greatest masses of armies in ancient Palestine. What happens in your mind to Gideon 300? That's a pretty respectable, that's pretty respectable, isn't it? Okay. Well, it's not very respectable if he's got a, if there's these 300 folks, and who do they have to fight against? They've got to attack 32,000 is that word again? Midianites. What does that tell you? What did they have to attack? 32 clans. 32 clans of Midianites. Yeah. Okay, let's read it again. <coughs> All right. We've already <laughs> we've already seen how Gideon was. Uh, Was Gideon's father a Yahwist or a, a Baalite? He was a Yahwist? He's probably a syncretist. Yeah, that's, I would be too. Um, let's begin reading in verse uh, 25. Uh, chapter 6. Chapter 6. <coughs> that night something happened. Yahweh said to him, Take the bull that belongs to your father, that the second one that is seven years old, and dismantle your father's altar to Baal. 
Do you all see that in your version? Okay. Now we have noticed that Gideon is exceedingly obsequious and he was so afraid to do this that he did it by night. Uh, this family father's altar to Baal and chop down the Asherah alongside it. You will build an altar for Yahweh your God on the highest point of this stronghold. You will take the number two bull and present it as a burnt offering using the wood of the Asherah, which you will chop down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did exactly as Yahweh told him to do. But he was too afraid of his father's household, of his father's household, and the townsmen to do it by day, so he did it at night. The townsmen got up early in the morning, and to their surprise, Baal's altar had been torn down and the Asherah alongside it chopped down, and the number two bull was being consumed on the altar which had been built. They said to one another, Who did this deed? They searched and made inquiry. They said, Gideon, son of Joash, did this deed. The townsmen said to Joash, Bring out your son and let him die. For he tore down Baal's altar and chopped down the Asherah alongside it. Joash said to all who stood around him, Will you prosecute for Baal, technical term. Are you going to rescue him? Whoever prosecutes for him will be put to death by morning. Since he is a god, let him make his own case because he tore down his altar. Is Joash saying that Baal is not a god? What's he saying? He's got enough to handle the situation himself. But anyway, he says, good. Bottom line, you're not going to do anything about it. Let's let Baal do something about it. But one gets the sense that Joash is doing what? Testing Baal. And you get the strong feeling that he's a Baalist who what? Isn't deeply devoted. What feeling did we get about Gideon when Yahweh came to him and sent his angel and said, do this and that? What feeling did we get about Gideon? What, is, he a, is he a strong Yahweh? No. So what feeling do you get? The family of backsliders, yes. Yeah. Is it Baal or Yahweh? What feeling do you get from them? It's what? Whatever. Yeah, that's the feeling you get from the story. Whatever. Yeah, that's exactly what Gideon said. Where, where's all the things that we heard that Yahweh did? Where were those wonders? And you get the feeling that Gideon will go forward if what? If he can see some wonders. So the angel of the Lord takes his meal and consumes it, so he gets a wonder. And, and what? Then what? And he's told in the strength of this wonder, but go tear down the altar there in, in his own little village, his own family's altar. This is his big act of courage, okay? And he begins his uh, revolution in behalf of Yahweh by doing what? By sneaking out at night with the slaves to tear the altar down. So he doesn't say no, after all he's seen a wonder, but what? He's not convinced that because the angel Lord could consume his dinner, that he could do what? Protect him from his clan, from his family. But he got found out anyway. Don't, don't you feel relieved that his father stood up for him? <laughs> what would have happened if his father said, okay? <laughs> well, maybe. Well, who do you think his father was? Well, it's, he, he's the top man in the village. And so his father was responsible for having, maintaining an altar to whatever God's supposed to be protecting the village at the moment. Remember, these were localized gods. Yeah. <clears throat> and so really this is a, 
uh, ref a poor reflection on his father that his son has done something like this. All right. And he named him on that day, verse 32 says. And he named him Jeruvial, saying, Let Baal prosecute him, for he tore down his altar. So it's let Baal prosecute. Uh, that's what... But Gideon is an adult, isn't he? <laughs> What's his father doing here? He's changing his name, even though he's an adult. Well, it was a patriarchal society, but you get the impression that even in a patriarchal society, Gideon was what? An excessively frightened son. All right. All right. Now then, let's go on to chapter 7, where we were. Let's see if we can deal with this now. Uh, whoever's afraid, the people are too many, always says verse 2. Whoever's afraid, verse 3, let him turn back, decamp from Mount Fearful. 22 units went home and 10 units were left. Verse 4. He always said to Gideon, <laughs> Well, hopefully then in... The I hope so. Why? They've been living for 300 years in Palestine as opposed to being slaves in Egypt. I hope they've grown. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Considerably. That's why ultimately they conquered all of the land. Now he said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Verse 4, make them go down to the water and I will purify them for you there. Seraph means to refine as you refine gold or silver in the fire. So purify. Here for my say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. But any of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he made the people go down to the water. And Yahweh said to Gideon, everyone who laps with his tongue the way a dog laps, set apart by himself, and everyone who goes down on his knees to drink water with hand to mouth set apart by himself. The total of those who laughed with their tongues was 300 men. All the rest of the people went down on their knees to drink water. Yahweh said to Gideon, With the 300 men that laughed, I will rescue you. I will subject Midian to your power. All the rest may go home. How did they get chosen? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. The one. Uh, yeah. Well, everyone who laughs with his tongue, the way a dog laughs, sets apart by himself. Everyone who goes down on his knees to drink water, hand to mouth, set apart by himself, like this. So. Who's the ones that get chosen? Yeah. Um, I had fun with this. <laughs> what characterizes an animal drinking? Picture a wolf or a dog. Dogs were domesticated wolves at this time. They were the first animal domesticated, but they were still wolves. What can you tell me about a, a dog or a wolf drinking? They're on guard. <laughs> My dog was very annoyed with me last week. I tried this several times to see <laughs> if I could sneak up on him while I was drinking. <laughs> I couldn't, but he was getting very annoyed. <laughs> he started growling at me the way he does when he doesn't like something that's happening. What characterized the people who laughed like a dog was their, their, their see a dog drink and it's head up and it's sniffing, it's watching, you can't sneak up on it, right? It, yeah. And these are the people who are tense, alert, they're looking around. Normally battle, battles don't begin till dawn, but they weren't thinking of, well, we don't need to worry about this till tomorrow. What are they thinking of? Yeah, might get ambushed. So that, this is a particular kind of person, right? 
Uh, on the one hand, we might characterize it as alert. On the other hand, we might characterize it as nervous. <laughs> yes, nerve wreck. And so we get all the alert or nervous people together. <laughs> Verse 7, Yahweh said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will rescue you. I will subject Midian to your power. All the rest may go home. They took the people's provisions and trumpets each into their own hands, and all the Israelites he sent away each to his own tent. And with the 300 men he stood fast. Midian's camp was below him in the valley. <laughs> okay, now, um, is this okay, the 300? Yeah, that's fine. So far we're doing good. That night something happened. So it gives you not to be pretty happy at this point, right? He's got the high ground. He's got the 300 men. He's got the provisions from all the rest of the clans of Manasseh, since this seems to have been the, the, the militia of Manasseh that followed him. Um, so they have plenty of provisions. They've got the high ground. He's got the 300 people. He should be happy, right? How is he? That night something happened. He always said to him, get up, go down into the camp, for I have subjected it to your power. He was supposed to go down right there. But what? Yes. <laughs> well, what God told him was, take the 300 men and go attack the pit camp now. That is going to come into your power. But what? But he was paralyzed. So, we get this in verse 10. If, however, you are afraid to go down, go down with your attaché, Pora, to the camp. You'll hear what they're saying. After that, you'll be much bolder if you go down into the camp. So what do we have? Remember that the angel of the Lord addressed him as, Hail, you mighty man of war. And uh, it's intended to be um, comical because of who he is and where he is and how he reacts and so forth. Uh, so this mighty man of war, he's got everything on his side, including especially the element of surprise. And what? He's too terrified to make an attack. Now, if this is his condition, I wonder what the condition of the 300 is. So anyway, they're going to sneak down. <laughs> This isn't exactly uh, Joshua, is it? <laughs> this, this is the successor to Moses. Okay, you got that? Uh, we're, we're in uh, we're in comic relief here. After that, you'll be much bolder and go down into the camp. So he and his attaché, Pora, went down to the vicinity of the armed men of the camp. See, this was family camp. It was a, a camp full of tents of family. <laughs> And they, knowing that they were marauders and invaders, had the armed men around the perimeter of their camp, fearing that somebody might do what? <laughs> yes. Uh, Midian and Amalek, all the Easterners, lay along the valley as numerous as locusts. The camels, camels were too many to count, as numerous as grains of sand on the seashore. When Gideon arrived, the man was just then describing a dream to his friends. He said, Look, I had a dream. And of all things, a moldy barley cake came tumbling into Midian's camp. It came to the tent. The tent should be capitalized here. When we say the White House, we don't mean any white house. We mean the White House. The tent is the tent of the military commander, the sheikh, the boss, the sheikh who's in charge of the whole thing. It's the tent. It came to the tent. Probably. And it struck it so that it fell, turning it upside down. The tent fell. His friend replied, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God has surrendered Midian and the entire force into his power. By God, does the Midianite mean Yahweh? No. 
He means the deity, right? Why would the parents first be the first No, but what has he done? No, I don't think it. I don't think it's a revelation. What has he done? I don't think it has anything to do with tearing down the altar, which was just a little village thing. What had he done? Yeah. Uh, chapter 6, verse 33. Same wording. All the Midianites and Amalekites, all the Easterners, rendezvoused, crossed over, and pitched camp in the valley of Jezreel. Well, uh, Abizer is on the slope of the valley of Jezreel. Where were these folks? why he was in the wine vat. Where were they? They were right there where he lived. Now what did he do? <laughs> Yahweh's spirit closed Gideon. He sounded the trumpet and the Bezerites were called out after him. On voice he dispatched throughout Manasseh. They too were called out after him. On voice he also sent to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, the tribes whose territories intersect in the valley of Jezreel. The folks were there and what did they hear? that one of the Israelites was doing what? Was calling out Israelite militia against them, which is why they were having sentries and walking around, watching, because they expected what? That at some point along the way, this Gideon might show up with... Now it's interesting. What was it that came and fell on the tent? Not just a barley cake, a moldy. a moldy or rotting barley cake. <laughs> now, you need be no exegetical genius to figure out what does the moldy barley cake represent? What's the moldy barley cake? Well, the interpretation is right there. Who, who or what is the moldy barley cake? This can be no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash. Where was he when this story began? He was threshing out barley in the wine press. And now I, I know what, what he was doing. This was not from the current crop. This was what? This was the old stuff, and you know when you get grain and you leave it somewhere, what does it do? Yeah. So, our, our hero is this moldy barley, okay? Uh, the fact that, that God has surrendered Midian into his power is good for, for our hero, because what? If he made a firm determination, whether it's Yahweh or Baal, that's going to be the one that Israel should rely on here. Fortunately, the wording of the Midianite is such that what? It could be either. One way or the other, God is on his side. This gives him power. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he felt prone before Yahweh. He returned to the Israelite camp and said, Up, for Yahweh has surrendered the Midianite force into your hand. He divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and emptied jars with torches inside the jars. Uh, yeah. This, this, they need about four hands here. We're going to have to uh, assume that the uh, the trumpets the are... Uh, ram's horns that they have on a thing around their neck. He said to them, keep your eye on me and do as I do, and especially when I come to the outskirts of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you blow the trumpets too, all around the entire camp and say for Yahweh and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men who were with him arrived at the camp's outskirts at the beginning of the middle watch, so it was about one o'clock in the morning, just as they had posted the sentry. They blew the trumpets while smashing the jars that were in their hands. Well, the point is, it's one o'clock in the morning. What are most people doing? <laughs> Fast asleep, and so... They blew the trumpets, smashing the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and shattered the jars. 
They held in the left hands the torches and the right hand the trumpet so as to blow and shouted the sword for Yahweh and for Gideon. They stood each man at his post around the camp and the entire force awoke with a start. They yelled and they fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, Yahweh set each man's sword against his own allies throughout the whole camp. The whole force fled toward Beth Shittah, toward Zerera, to the border of Abel Mahola near Tabat. So they went down the Jezreel Valley, into the Jordan Valley, across the Jordan Valley, and they're trying probably to either go south down the Jordan Valley or else up one of the uh, wadis to the plateau of Transjordan so they can get to the King's Highway, go south towards Arabia, whence they came. All right, so the element of surprise worked what did Gideon and his men not have to do? Well, they didn't have to fight, that's the point. Okay. Now then, what happened next? Can I have some translation to the mold we part out? Mine doesn't stay mold. Yeah, good idea. Um, what's your translation? Is it yeah. All right, chapter 7. Oh, pardon me. Chapter uh, 7, verse 23. The Israelites rallied from Naphtali, from Asher, and from all Manasseh, and chased after Midian. And onward, Gideon sent throughout the Ephraimite hill country, come down against the Midianites, and capture the watering places from them, as far as Beth Barah, and also of the Jordan. So the Ephraimites rallied, they captured the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. They captured two Midianite commanders, Oreb and Zeev. They executed Oreb at Oreb's rock and Zeev as they executed at Zeev's wine press. They chased Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeev to Gideon across the Jordan. Well, you know that immediately south of Manasseh is Ephraim's territory and <coughs> reaches down to the Jordan Valley. So as the Midianites were rushing southward along the Jordan Valley, uh, the envoys of Gideon said, get down there quick and, and uh, cut off the Midianites who were fleeing from our area, from the Jezreel Valley. And they caught two commanders, not in the same place, but two groups. They caught two groups of them. Verse uh, 1. The Ephraimite said to him, what is this that you've done to us by not calling us when you went to fight Midian? They argued vigorously with him. He said, What now have I done as compared with you? <laughs> well, the good thing about Gideon is he may be shallow and whimpish, but that saves him from the usual intertribal disaster. Why? This is a soft answer that turneth away wrath. It's not the soft answer that turneth away wrath because he's such a good person, but what? Yes, yeah. yeah, it's right. He doesn't want to fight with you. you might. What now have I done as compared with you? Is not the gleaning of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizar? Into your power has Yahweh surrendered Midian's commanders, Orav and Zeev. What have I been able to do as compared with you? When he said this, their indignation against him subsided. It's, uh, it's funny how this develops. The what are these names? Wolf and what's the other one? They're not the 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 military uh, unit names named after animals. Okay. Well, the point is that he's already he was already a messenger of the Lord. He'd already been in Moses' place. The Lord could inspire him to say the right thing. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, at this point, we have to say, well, how are things going with uh, this latest judge from what we've seen? So far, it looks like it's going to turn out well, even though he has started out badly, right? Here, at this point, one would seem to get the impression that uh, maybe it was just an initial hesitancy on his part that once he had taken over, uh, things would turn out well and spiritually Israel would be on the upswing and things are getting better 
if that were true, it would be odd. Why would it be odd? Yes, because enough pattern in the book of Judges. What happens? Things get worse and worse, not, not better. Let's see, let's see what happened here. Verse 4. And Gideon came to the Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men who were with him, faint yet pursuing. So he said to the elders of Sukkoth, that's Booth, that, that city right in the flat middle of the Jordan Valley, right in the very flat middle, on the other side of the Jordan, before you reach the foothills to go up into the Transjordanian Mountains. And let us remember that Sukkot was still a Canaanite city in the territory of Ephraim. So this is a Canaanite town. And this is where the uh, Telfiorala, where the texts about uh, Balaam were found on the plastered wall. A whole nother series of texts, of the so-called Balaam texts were discovered uh, when the thing was excavated in the 60s. And uh, he says, Pray give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are faint, and I am pursuing after Ziba and Zalmun and the kings of Midian. The officials of Sukkot said, Are Ziba and Zalmun already in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? Okay. Something about the Gideon story that's quite striking. Gideon didn't want to do anything for Yahweh until he had seen wonders. Right? And he saw a wonder and so he tore down the altar and then he was supposed to go out and deliver them from Midian. But he didn't want to take that next step until he'd seen some other wonders. So what did he ask for? He, uh, yeah. Now the fleece did what he asked it to do, which is an ancient form of divination. Would be better suited to Baal worship than to Yahweh worship. But after it did what he wanted it to do, was he satisfied? No. He wanted what? He wanted it to do the reverse, another form of divination. What did he want? He wanted a sure thing. Um, what quality is lacking? Yeah, no faith to that. He was ready to attack Midian when he had all the militia of Manasseh. And God wouldn't allow it. Why? What did what did he and they want? Yeah, they wanted a sure thing. And and God said, if you want a sure thing, then you're going to say you did it. When it wasn't a sure thing anymore, although three hundred was certainly and what followed thereafter shows it was certainly plenty to handle the 32 clans of Midianites. The 30, 32 families of Midianites certainly wasn't any bigger. And one should assume, well, there's probably not more than 300 fighting men in Midian down there and they're all asleep. These folks should have said, what? We'll kill the sentries and they'll be gone in a moment. But what? But Gideon was no longer satisfied because what? He didn't have a sure thing. And he was afraid now to attack. Okay. Until he went down and heard the dream and decided what? That he did have a sure thing. Yes. The elders of Sukkot uh, are oddly appropriate reflections of Gideon. They want a sure thing. We're not helping you. You don't have Ziba Zalmona. The implication is clear. We don't have proof that you'll catch him and kill him. And if we side with you and you don't catch him and kill him, then what? Then they're going to come back and get us. What do the elders of Sukkot want? They want a sure thing. All right. Uh, Gideon said, Well then, when Yahweh has given Ziba and Zalmona into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. <laughs> now why is that odd? What strikes you as odd about that? 
Uh, it's still a lot of character, yet this is the person who never says anything, who said to the angel of the Lord, B, which means, oh, please. <laughs> yet, he's going to flail their flesh with the thorns of the wilderness. What impression do I get about what he's feeling right now? Brave. He's feeling what? No, I, I wouldn't say brave. Feeling what? Well, angry, but what does he have? What does he think he has? He's got what? He thinks, despite what they may think, he's got a sure thing. Okay, so I'll flow you with the thorns of the wilderness, with briars. And from there he went up to Penuel. And what does that mean? Face of God, remember that? Who, what, what was that story about? Jacob and the angel, remember? The angel struggling at night to see your face is like seeing the face of God, he said to Esau. Remember that? Yeah. So, so this is up the wadi of the Javik River. And he came there, and, the, and they answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered. And he said to the men of Penuel, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Penuel was still a Canaanite town also with its tower. Now, Ziba and Zalmona were in Karkor with their army, about 15 units. What does that tell me? All who were left of the uh, uh, people of the east. There had fallen 120 who drew the sword, 120 men who drew the sword. Well, they had how many units in the first place? 32. How many do they have now? 15. About half of them had gotten killed, 120 men. So how many fighting men, I'm going to ask again, how many fighting men about did the Midianites have? Yes. Yeah. Question. Did they have more than Gideon? No. Oh my, I thought I had 300 men to attack, attack 32,000. Right? <laughs> Instead, I had 300 men who attacked 250 who were asleep. No, there's no difference in the number of, of clans. Clans has nothing to do with how many men from that clan are currently fighting men. And the Midianites in particular were not an army. What were they? They were not an army. What were they? They were Well, they were marauders at the moment, but what were they normally? They were camel traders. Yes who had crossed the Jordan into the West Bank, Palestine. We're talking family and whatever, sheep and goats. Sheep and goats and grandma camels and grandma, grandma and grandpa. Yes. Yeah. The whole bank traveling around. Was camped in the Valley of Jezreel, the rich Valley of Jezreel, doing what? Yeah. And why did the Israelites fight against them? Because these Midianites fought on what? on their camels. And this was the time of the domestication of the camel at the beginning of the Iron Age. And the Israelites had never before been exposed to camels. <coughs> it's obvious that they had no idea what to do. <coughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And so the folks were all down there encamped in their tents, their houses. Oh yeah, as soon as the uh, being Midianites, the very definition of which is being uh, traitors, that after the uh, harvest was gone, what would they have done? But unfortunately by then, if Israel, if the, if the local tribes, Zebulun and Asher and, and northern Manasseh, 
uh, and Issachar had waited till then, what would have been the problem? All of their sustenance, it says at the beginning of the story, would have been gone. So they couldn't afford to wait. Yes, their sustenance, all of it. Yes, because these little Hebrew villages were easy prey for them. Yes, easy pickings, and then they could just go on. They, they were sort of acting like the gypsies of the ancient East here. Yeah. So then, going back to this, then James and Job have to carry No, don't get the... Don't get the classical story of Job related to this at all. Okay, my question is because it specifies that Job had a camel besides sheep and donkeys. Yes, it does. But now remember that the whole setting, how many did he have? Tell me about Job. Tell me the details of Job. But no, no. But you should remember because it's so, it should tell you something about what you're reading. Three, three clans of camels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, because no, because this is a time when they are reading when this is when you have Greek words already in the Old Testament when thousand meant thousand. He had seven. Well, there were born to him seven sons, three daughters. Base is ten. What period are we in? Base is ten, not twelve. What period are we in? Babylonian. He had 7,000 sheep and what? 3,000 camels. As he had 7 sons and 3 daughters and 500 yoke of oxen, which is how many? 1,000. 500 she asses, which of course has to mean 1,000 asses. In short, this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And what are those details? Those are the ideal details of what kind of a person? No, not a prince. The ideal man. The ideal made up. An example of what the perfect ideal man would be, would be what? Someone who had what? How many sons? Seven sons. And how many children in all? Not 12, but in this period, 10. In short, this man was what? The greatest of the people of the East. Don't press those details historically at all. Getting back to the history here. <laughs> Once upon a time, George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. And his father came home and was very dismayed to discover that the cherry tree had been chopped down. And he said, who chopped down the cherry tree? And little George, what? I cannot tell a lie. He said, I cannot tell a lie, Father. I chopped down the cherry tree. Was there really a George Washington? Yeah. Yes, there was. Did he chop down the cherry tree? No. No, he didn't. Because Parson Weems, when he wrote a book of illustrative stories, to train little characters, wrote stories about George Washington. And he said what? I made up these stories to illustrate to the children what their character should be like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm taking away Gideon's man and George's cherry tree all in the same afternoon. That's, <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> George Washington wasn't a wimp, though. He was a very strong personality. Yes, that's what the parson said. <laughs> and there the parson caught himself. Why? Because... No, but that's a good example. Because when... And it wasn't the Potomac. It was the river that they crossed when they went to, to surprise 
Philadelphia where all the Hessian troops were. But what, what is interesting about the story is what you just said. It has to do with the camels in Job. There weren't any camels and there weren't in Job's day and there weren't any what? There weren't any dollars in Washington's day. <laughs> But it made for an interesting story. Yes. <laughs> that little children should be strong and brave and truthful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. If somebody wrote it today, they'd probably say it was a baseball that he threw across the river, right? And again, we'd have to say what? Yes. Yes. Now then. All right, so the, the, the bottom line answer to your question is it has nothing to do with dating Job. Now then, getting back, <laughs> the, uh, because it wasn't an army, because the Midianites weren't an army, but just car camel caravaneers who were preying off the land, yes, because all that Gideon had were, were militia. What they had was clans full of folk. Well, I'm sure they did. <coughs> there were some armed men, weren't there? Because Gideon and his attaché went down and came to the region of where the armed men were. Well, of course, being caravaneers, they could have gotten arms from lots of places. The iron was introduced to Palestine probably by the Philistines, the people of the sea. They brought iron from other parts of the Mediterranean and then iron spread through Palestine. <coughs> yes, or, or a stone or anything. <laughs> Now then, Gideon went up, verse 11, by the caravan route, which tells us exactly what these folks were doing when they were fleeing. What were they doing? They were going back on the caravan route that they were used to. And what did they obviously think? Having crossed the Jordan, gotten away from the Valley of Jezreel, gotten away from the Hebrew villages, what did they think? <laughs> yes. Now, I have an impression here about the Midianites and the Amalekites. Having lost 120 men and been surprised by what appeared to be a vast army, what seems to have been their attitude? Would, would they have come back anytime soon? No. Now, what, what is the case here is that it, was, it took a long time to get Gideon started, get that fire lit under him. But once he tasted victory, what did he decide to do? <laughs> How far? <laughs> yeah, now he's up into Transjordan, and he attacked the army, for the army was off its guard, and Zeb and Zalmona fled, and he pursued them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeb and Zalmona, and threw all the army into a panic. Then. Gideon the son of Joash returned from the battle by the ascent of Heres, which is the name for the sun god, and he caught a young man of Sukkoth and questioned him, and he wrote down for him the officials and elders of Sukkoth, 77 men. That happens to be the perfect number, isn't it? Right? We've got that. How many of the elders did he find out about? All of them. Now, are you reading between the lines? What's happened to Gideon now? Yeah, what, what he needed to do and what the Lord told him to do was what? To get the Midianites and the Amalekites out of there. And that happened just like that. But what? <laughs> yeah, he's gone beyond deliverance to vengeance. He's gone from deliverance to vengeance.
big problem is they're taking that. You must do that because their crops, they still need to plant. If he doesn't go far enough, they're going to come back and revive him again. Well, but that's possible that that would have been what God wanted. You went crazy to just get blood on the river. Yeah. He came to the men of Sukkot, verse 15, and said, Behold, Zeb and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me, saying, A Zeb and Zalmunna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your men who are faint. And he took the elders of the city, and he took thorns from the wilderness and briars with them, and taught the men of Sukkot. Yeah, how? And he broke down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. Now, is there anything in the law or in his directions from, from the Lord that told him to do any of this? What's he doing here? Yeah, he's uh, he's become a little tyrant from somebody who was yes. Now that God has given him some power, he's become what? A little despot. Then he said to Zeb and Salmona, "Where are the men whom you slew at Tabor?" They answered, as you are, so were they, every one of them. They resembled the sons of a king. <laughs> what are these two men trying to do? In order to do what? Save their lives. He said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As Yahweh lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, rise and slay them. But the youth did not draw his sword, but he was afraid because he was still a youth. Then Ziba and Zalmunna said, Rise yourself and fall on us, for as a man is, so is his strength. Gideon rose and slew Ziba and Zalmunna, and he took the crescents that were on the necks of their camels. Is this comparable to Joshua killing the kings of, of the Canaanite city-state? It is not. This does not represent the law of Perim that's in Deuteronomy. The Deuteronomist is telling this without comment, but we know he's telling the, us this what? As an example of how bad things were. Of course, we always have this question to ask. Why didn't the Lord go get somebody better? <laughs> you see that tongue in cheek, why? What <laughs> is then the men of Noah said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also. They want him to become an hereditary king in the Canaanite manner. For you have delivered us out of the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you, Yahweh will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Give me every man of you. Hey, that's a pretty good answer, right? Uh, except that he had a motivation in saying it. <laughs> he didn't want to be king. He wanted to be something else. What? Yeah. He wanted to be not the king of Israel, but the priest of Israel. He had an idea in his mind to be somebody. Who did he have, well, the story is written this way intentionally. Who did he have in his mind to be? <laughs> he thought of himself as Joshua when he was killing the <coughs> king. What occurred to him? So what did he do here? Gideon said, let me make a request of you. Give me every man of you the earrings of his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread out a garment, and every man cast in it the earrings from the spoil, and the way the gold earrings, the request was a 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescents and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, the collars that were about the necks of their camels, and Gideon made an ephod and put it in his city. What role is he playing now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's the high priest of Israel. Yeah. Okay. So he has it in his mind now, and that's why he said Yahweh will rule over you. <laughs> and what? 
and I I always preached. Yeah. So now he had an idea. His idea was that kings can be fought against by other kings, and folks could rise in Israel and try to dispossess my my family of kingship. But what? Yeah, priest. That's a better, more secure position. Let me become, let my family become the priesthood. I wonder how the Mushite and Aaronite families felt about this. Do you think that anything good is going to come of this? No? Isn't his son with the actors? Yes. <clears throat> I wonder if that was the son's original name or if he changed the name to that. Why would why would that be significant? The son's name being Yetha. Yeah, because it, that's a Mushite name. That's the name of the priestly family of Moses. Yeah. All right. Now then, he put it in his city and offer, and all the Israelites placed a harlot after it there and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. Do you remember the, uh, the opening comments of Judges where he, where the Deuteronomist sets his tone statement for the book, where he sets his theme statement? What did he say? Back to Judges 2 and 3. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what does it say here? Beginning, shall we read the theme statement, beginning verse 11? The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh and served the Baals, for they forsook Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were round about them and bowed to them and they provoked Yahweh to anger. They forsook Yahweh and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So Yahweh was enraged against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. He sold them into the power of their enemies round about so they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of Yahweh was against them for evil as Yahweh had warned and as he had sworn to them so that they were in sore straits. He raised up judges who saved them out of the power of those who plundered them, and yet they did not listen to the judges. And they played the harlot after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of Yahweh, and they did not do so. Whenever Yahweh raised up judges for them, Yahweh was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For Yahweh was moved to pity by the groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. Whenever the judge died, they turned back and behaved worse than the fathers, going after other gods. Serving them and bowing down to them, they did not drop any of their practices or stubborn ways. So Yahweh was enraged against Israel and said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant, which I have commanded their fathers, they have not obeyed my voice, I will not henceforth drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died, that by them I may test Israel whether they will take care to walk in the ways of Yahweh as their fathers did or not. So Yahweh left those nations not driving them out at once, and he did not give them into the hands of Joshua. Now these are the nations which Yahweh left to test Israel by them, that is, all in Israel had no experience of war in Canaan. It was only that the generations of the people of Israel might know war, that he might teach war to such as had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites, from Lebanon to Baal Hermon, as far as the entrance of Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of Yahweh which he commanded their fathers by Moses. So the people of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters to themselves for wives and their sons that they might serve their gods, and they did so. Uh, and they did what was evil and so forth. Now, what is, strikes me about that is its length. Why am I struck by its length? In this book he does something that's somewhat different from what he did in Joshua. In Joshua he rewrote the stories and inserted a lot of Deuteronomic stuff into the individual stories. Here the stories stand almost devoid of De Deuteronomic terminology. Have you noticed that? 
And instead, where does the Deuteronomist speak? At the beginning and interspersed at the ends of the various stories. He chooses to let the stories stand as he has received them. Where do you suppose the Deuteronomist got these stories? Where do they come from? Well, how many judges are there? Twelve. How many tribes are represented by the judges that we have in the book? All twelve in his scheme of the greater Israel, Israel and Judah. There's a judge for each tribe, and so he has constructed a, a schema of judges from each tribe to represent the judgeship that was carried out in all Israel. These are traditional stories. Such changes as he made would be noted right away. Why? When somebody told the story of the Shamgar, how many would know that story? Everybody would, yeah. Such changes in notes as he makes in the story of Gideon are there for what purpose? To say this was good or not good. Not good. Can you pick up the thread of where the Aaron that priesthood is and the Moshe priesthood is? Well, the Moshe priesthood, I know where they are. Where are they? Except for Hebrew. <laughs> Where are they? What town are they in? No, that's not a good answer. <laughs> Where are they? Shiloh. Shiloh. Saved yourself, huh? Now can you really, really impress me and tell me where the Aaronites were? What town above all of this? Yes. <laughs> Did you all get that? Hebron. The Covenant League City of the Southern League. In the main, in general, in this early period, it is safe to say that the Northern League was administered by the family of Moses and the Southern League was administered by the family of Aaron. But then must have been some falling away or getting them uh, yeah, what was the condition of Shiloh at this time? Now, the Beza in the Jezreel Valley is quite a bit north, quite a good long walk north of Shiloh, and it's a local village, and apparently he meant it to be a cult center for the northern tribe, northern Manasseh, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, apparently. Yes, how would the Mushites have put up with this? I'm not sure, but it happened. Yeah. All right, going back here, it became a trap, which is one of his main words. Um, now, this is the setting for, for the next story, isn't it? How uh, it became a trap for Israel. They played the harlot, became a trap to Gideon and his family. Verse 28. 828. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel and they lifted up their heads no more. How often did the Midianite caravaneers come back into Palestine? How often did they cross the Jordan again? They did not. That was, that was a, a bitter enough experience so that they never try that again and the land had rest 40 years the days of Gideon okay no well, they did try it again ever this is not the this is not their next problem now the next thing is interesting Jerubbiel the son of Joash went and dwelt in his own house now Gideon had Seventy sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. So he's the bringer of, as priest, he's the bringer of fertility. This was exceedingly admirable, isn't it? What did they do, Richard, when he had the 72nd or 73rd or 74th son? Did they kill him or what? 
No, the 70 is what? The 70 is what? Yeah, so what kind of a number is it? Yeah, so what kind of a number is it historically? Yeah. It's a round number, right? Huh? Yeah, he might have had 75 or 68. How many folk were there in the heavenly court? Besides the chief god, how many sat around with him? Seventy. Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, very deliberately in huh? the sons of God, yeah. Yeah, the seventy sons of God. What? Yeah. No, I think he's an also. And I'll tell you why. He's not named among them. Uh, he had many wives. So this is a real, ideal, pagan Canaanite picture, right? Yeah. Would it be considered that there would be a firstborn for each, for each wife? Yeah, but the firstborn wouldn't be significant here. I so, was thinking back to the matter of, you know, numbers and how many there were and how many firstborn there were. Because the firstborn were just counted by the firstborn to a man, then that would be different than the firstborn for each wife. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the point here is that the 70 sons represent the heavenly court in the Canaanite model, with Gideon playing the role of what? The high god. Yeah. So that a beezer on the slopes of Mount uh, Gilboa or across Mount Gilboa becomes a new cosmic mountain. Okay. And the heavenly temple is right there. I've got the picture, and it's a Canaanite picture. <laughs> All right. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel will again turn again. Whoops. What should we say? I'm reading the RSV. I'm reading verse 33. What should we say? Yes. The people of Israel continued to play the harlot after the Baals and made Baal Bari their god. Now, Baal just means Lord, right? It's not the proper name of the god. There wasn't a god whose name was Baal. Baal, rather, is the title. What does it mean? Master, Lord. Yeah, it just means Lord. What was this God's proper name, by the way? We, we speak about this fellow Baal, and we talk about the Baal epic and all that stuff. What was this God's name, anyway? It wasn't Baal. Baal means Lord. Dagon. Uh, Dagon was his father. He came very close, I'm impressed. <laughs> well, in fact, that's another title that is used for him. Um, you would have you would have done well in King and Ice Cities. They just would have thought you were dumb, but that you were <laughs> religious but dumb. Um, and you can and you can even think about why it works. Dagon was what kind of a god initially? A fish. He was a sea god. And Baal was the god of storms. And where did the storms come from? From off the... Right? And so it makes sense that Baal was the son of... Yes. Ah, oh, tell you. Uh, his name was Hadad. Or Hadad. You recognize this name in the names of various kings of Syria later in Israel's history who fought with Israel. Ben Hadad. So what does that mean? He was the son of Hadad. And who was Hadad? Baal. Son of Baal, sure. Son of God. Yes. Aren't we having fun? Back to the priesthood. We're assuming that they all apostatized during this period. Yeah. It does seem to be that uh, there's no strong priesthood keeping them in line here. Um, now, berith means covenant, doesn't it? That's the Hebrew word for covenant. 
you remember that at Shechem, Israel made a what? A covenant. Who was the father of Shechem? Oh, I know you know it's just right on the tip of your tongue. Hamor. What does Hamor mean? Donkey. Ass. What was Shechem? The city of the donkeys. Donkey city is what you would call it. And why? Before there were camels. Before there were camels, there were what? There were donkeys. And donkey caravans. And these donkey caravaneers all had to go through that path. And you can see that trade would not work out unless what? Unless they made a what? A covenant. And how did they actually make this covenant? Well, we know from the Canaanite thing. They killed a, take a guess, a donkey. Yes, this is a, this is a group that catches things fast. They killed a donkey and that was their way of making a covenant to cut the animal in half in Genesis 15 what did Abraham do? no I don't think it was a pigeon a calf or something this would be the patriarchal equivalent of such a covenant let's just look at it in Genesis 15 three animals well let's see Yes, verse 9, 15, 9. He said, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a she goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought all of these, cut them in two, laid each half over against the other, and a bird on the side, which he didn't cut. So, this is very much like the Canaanite covenant of cutting the two parts of the donkey and laying them side by side. Now, this was at Shechem. So Shechem, the father of Shechem, was Hamor, the ass. Well, because it's uh, the city where these donkey caravans apparently had their... That relates to another story in Genesis. Where is that? The humbling of Dinah. Um, remember when Simeon and Levi... Uh, yes, chapter 34 now Dinah the daughter of Leah whom she had born to Jacob went out to visit the women of the land and when Shechem the son of Hamor the Hivite the prince of the land saw her what do we have here Shechem the son of Hamor what do we have here we have the personification of the city and the city's business. Okay. Now, this is all very interesting, isn't it? What part, when we, when we studied Joshua, what part of the land was there no conquest, no battle, no record of conquest? Shechem. Shechem. Where did the Israelites go to make a covenant? To Shechem. Hmm. Interesting. Now, it says that Joshua wrote these words by the great stone that was there at Shechem, the great cult pillar. I showed you a picture of the ancient city of Shechem and the huge cult pillar. It's still there. It's tremendous. There you go. I just found it falling over and they put that part of it which is still <coughs> whole back up. It's a monolith. It was still there. The, the, the temple was still there. Yeah, the late bronze temple that was the temple of this period is still there. But well, what's its remains at least. Now it's interesting. Mm -hmm. When these donkey caravaneers made their covenant, who would they made, have made the covenant through? What God would they have asked to oversee such a covenant? Well, who would that be if they were in in Shechem? What God was lording it over Palestine at the time, late Bronze Age? Who was the champion, the big God? 
expand. Yeah. Now then, you can see the potential, can't you, if Israel went to Shechem and made a covenant of its obvious associations with the Canaanite covenants under Baal. Got it? It would be very easy to equate what gods? Baal and Yahweh. Mm. And what was the result of Gideon's priesthood and judgeship? As soon as Gideon died, the people continued to play the harlot after the Baals and made Baal to be their god. Now what's the national god of Israel? Baal Berit, which is a mingling of what? Mingling of traditions about Baal and Yahweh. Now this, tell, this capstone tells me the whole meaning of the story of Gideon. I could see it all the way through. I could see it in the angel of Yahweh, angel of God business. And I could see it in his half-hearted devotion to Yahweh and his father's half-hearted devotion to, to Baal. What could I see? I could see that there was no great distinction in their mind. Right? And I also noticed that Gideon, before he got very far into it, was known by what name? Jerubia, which means what? Let Baal prosecute. The judge of Israel's name is Let Baal prosecute. <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't want to do that. No. <laughs> we don't want to be part of Gideon's band. And the friends of Gideon. Yeah. Well, Gideon's band are the, are the Laodiceans of the period of the judges. <laughs> Those who halted between two opinions. They got to Shechem and went no further. Okay. <clears throat> they made Baal Berit their god. And the people of Israel did not remember Yahweh their god, who had rescued them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And they did not show kindness to the family of Jerubbiel, really Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done for Israel. Now he's going to illustrate this. That's the narrator speaking. You know that, don't you? When we hear this, they continued to do what was evil and it became a snare and a trap. Who's speaking? That's the Deuteronomic historian speaking, giving us the framing of these stories, right? Yeah, we don't have much left of uh, Gideon by the time he gets done here. And now we're going to tell, find out more. Now Abimelech, the son of Jerubbiel, went to Shechem to his mother's kinsmen and said to them and to the whole clan of his mother's family, say in the ears of all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jerubbiel rule over you or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Remember Adam and Eve? This is now my bone and my bone and flesh and my flesh. And his mother's kinsmen spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the men of Shechem and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of baal Bari, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And he went to his father's house in Afra, and he slew his brothers, the sons of Jerubbiel, seventy men upon one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbiel, was left, for he hid himself. And all the citizens of Shechem came together, and all Beth Milo, that's the built-up plot, Milo just needs to fill, and they went and made Abimelech king, by the oak of the pillar at Shechem, where Joshua had made the covenant. Okay? Now, we know that this covenant included the Shechemites. They had become part of Israel. Now, the Shechemites are still a distinct unit. They're still Canaanite. 
and they're back to worshiping Baal. Why? Because Israel as a whole is now worshiping Baal Bari, Lord of the Covenant, right? Okay. And his initial argument is, don't let these 70 sons of Jerubbiel, this priesthood, rule over you as 70 men. After all, I'm your brother. In other words, you're Canaanite, what? I'm a Canaanite. Don't let the implication is, don't let these Israelite, non-Canaanite types rule over you. Now, we're going to see that he's deceitful in this momentarily. He says this to get the Canaanite part of the Israelite population on his side for one purpose only, so that they will finance his murder of his brothers and his becoming king. However, his attitude, he's a half-breed. Do you understand? He is a half-breed. He is half Canaanite, half Israelite, and he's grown up in Shechem. So his attitude is on which side of the coin? Toward the Canaanite side. But he intends to do something else. This is deceit on his part. Because he soon shows us that his policy as king will be to get all Israel behind him by doing what? By massacring the Canaanite population. Mm. So he appeals first to the Canaanites saying, I'm one of you, support me. He gets this support so he can murder his brothers. He becomes king, and then what does he do? Now comes one of the most famous passages in Judges and in the whole Bible. Jotham's Carmel. Famous, famous passage in the Bible. When it was told Jotham, he went and stood. This is the, the young son who has escaped. He stood on the top of Mount Gerizim. And from up there, they can't catch you right away. Cause they have to run up the mountain to get you. They can't get you that fast, but you can run away. But they can hear as you're shouting down what he said from the top of the mountain. And he said, uh, listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. Notice the use of the term God. None of us are talking about what? Yahweh. <clears throat> the trees once went forth to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Shall I leave my fatness, by which gods and men are honored, to go and sway over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come you, and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit, and go sway over the trees? And the trees said to the vine, Come you, and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my wine? By the way, the word wine there is tirosh, pressed out, fresh grape juice. Shall I leave my grape juice, my fresh grape juice, which cheers God and men to go spray over the trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, Come you and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in good faith you are anointing the king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, of course, it's meant to be ironic because the bramble has what? Does it have any shame? No. no. Yes. Better think of the theme of the brambles of the wilderness. What did Father do with the brambles of the wilderness? He flayed the men of the two Canaanite cities, Penuel and Sukkot. That's a forerunner of what's happening here. And devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you acted in good faith and honor when you made Abimelech king, if you've dealt well with Jerubbiel in his house and have done him as his deeds deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and rescued you from the hand of Midian, and you've risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his son, seventy men on one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant king over the citizens of Shechem, because he is your kinsman, if you then have acted in good faith and honor with Jerubbiel in his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech, and devour the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out of the citizens of Shechem and from Beth Milo, and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled, and went to the well, and dwelt there for fear 
of Abimelech, his brother. He hid in the well. I don't know what well. <laughs> what well? I don't know. It doesn't say. But anyway, while his brother was around, how was his life? I, I so does mine. That's and what does fear mean? The well. Yeah. <laughs> Abimelech ruled over Israel three years, and God. Notice the use of the terminology. Set an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the violent sons of the seventy sons of Jerubbiel might come, and their blood be laid on Abimelech and their brother, who slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hand to slay his brothers. God did this. It doesn't say he allowed it. It says he sent an evil spirit to bring it about. The men of Shechem put men in ambush against him in the mountaintops, and they robbed all who passed by them along the way, and it was told of Bimelech. Okay, now that, uh, can that part of the story continues in verse 42. On the following day, the men went out into the fields, and the Bimelech was told. Okay, but now we're going to interrupt that story to give a second reason for trouble between Abimelech and the Shechemites. Verse 26 tells us another story about trouble between them. And Jael the son of Ebed moved into Ebed Stone, right? No, um, slave. He moved into Shechem with his kinsmen, and the men of Shechem put providence in him. And they went out into the field and gathered the grapes from their vineyards and trod them and held their great festival. What time of the year is it? Early and later. What? Here, yeah, here's the fall. We can't go by here. <laughs> when's the vintage harvest and when's the barley harvest? The vintage harvest is in the spring. How do you know that? Yeah. Well. What, did they use wine for Passover? Mm -hmm. Passover is in the spring, right? Mm -hmm. Was it fermented or unfermented wine? Mm -hmm. What? Fresh. Fresh. You think they used fermented wine for Passover? <laughs> well, what could they not use? They couldn't use anything that... They even had to get the leaven out. So what does that tell you? And that's why the rabbis have to tell us how to get fresh wine. That's why we have wine skins. That's why we have to boil it down into jelly and put it under the earth and preserve it so that we'll have fresh wine for Passover. Yeah. As we gather our gleanings in the, uh, our harvest of grapes and tread them out in the fall. It's the best grapes. Now, and the, and the, the figs grow during the summer and we harvest them in the fall vintage harvest okay now they held their festival and went into the house of their god and ate and drank and reviled Abimelech and Jael the son of Ebed said who is this Abimelech and who are we of Shechem that we should serve him did not this son of Jerubbiel and Zerul his officer his officer here in the city uh, serve the men of Hamor the father of Shechem Hamor the father of Shechem is anybody awake here what does this remind you of? What did we just read? Dinah, Hamor, and Shechem. But that was the time of the patriarch. Either there's more than one Hamor, the father of Shechem, or it's a what? It's a title. Mm. Why then should we serve him? Would that this people under my hand, then I would remove Abimelech. I would say to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. When Zavol, the ruler of the city, who is obviously ruling in behalf of Abimelech, heard the words of Jael, the son of Abed, his anger was kindled, and he sent messages to Abimelech at a rumor saying, which is where, uh, or Orma rather, or Torma, saying, Behold, Jael, the son of Abed, and his kinsmen have come to Shechem, the story of the city against you. Now therefore go by night, you and the men who are with you, and lie and wait in the field. Then in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, rise early and rush on the city. When he and the men that are with him come out against you, 
you may do to them as occasion offers. Abimelech and all the men that were with him rose up by night, got to the city so that they could be there in the morning, wait, laid in wait against Shechem in four companies. What does this make you think of? Does any of this sound familiar? Yes. And Jael, the son of Ebed, went out and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city, and Abimelech and the men that were with him rose from the ambush. When Jael saw the men, he said to Zavol, look, men are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zavol said to him, you see the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. Jael spoke again and said, look, men are coming down from the center of the land, and one from the direction of the diviner's oak. Zavol said, okay, one of the things that clarifies that this story is, people tell stories and say, this is what's happening, and this is what it appears to be. And one of the things that characterizes this story is that when somebody tells you something, what? Or when somebody does something, what? It's something else other than what you think it is. When Abimelech says to the Shechemites, I'm with you Shechemites, I'm on the side of the Canaanites, what should we know? He's not, that he's going to kill the Canaanites. And his brothers think he's what? On their side, but what? He's not. He may seem to be a great king, but he's really a what? A bramble. Okay? Uh, and Jael says, if I were king, I'd deal with this fellow Abimelech. But when Abimelech comes, what? He doesn't. <laughs> and when he says, I see men, and Zavol says what? You only see the shadows. What? He doesn't see shadows, he sees men. It's one of the things that characterizes this story is watch out what somebody tells you because what? Yeah. It isn't appearance, but it's reality that counts. It's characteristic of this story. Where is this headed? This is headed toward what happens to the monarchy and the worship of the god El or Baal Bari, right? I haven't finished up with Israel was in the hands of the god Baal Bari, right? And now it's in the hands of a monarchy dedicated to Baal Bari, and we want to see how things go for Israel under the worship of this syncretistic god, part Yahweh, part Baal. Yes. Well, this is an abortive kingship that lasted three years. Yeah. I guess it, yeah, it sort of counts because it's in the history. Well, what does Israel mean? What does Israel mean at this time? Well, <laughs> the Northern League, to say the Northern Kingdom is a little... Yes. Um, what did Saul rule over? Judah and Israel. He's never given credit for it, but how could he chase David all over the Judean desert and all the way down to the Dead Sea to Masada and make it so dangerous for David that the only place it could go to be safe was yeah, Philistia. How could Saul do that? The answer is what? He was king of Israel and he was also king of Judah. Yeah. Now the house of David, and the stamp of that in the Old Testament, would like us to believe that the united monarchy was the result of David. What it was the result of was David destroying the house of Saul. But that's a story for another day. All right. We'll stop here. <laughs>